Um, so I was planning to, I mean, I, this is partly for a, um, a kind of project I'm working on looking at discernment. Um, mm -hmm. I'm interested in basically discernment as it's practiced in this new psychedelic industry that's, that's booming, that's about to kind of take off in the US. And so thousands and perhaps millions of people are going to have mystical ecstatic experiences which they're not always necessarily prepared to make sense of right so what i'm curious about is discernment practices how do um people who have ecstatic experiences in other cultures make sense of them and that made me think of of your work so that that was that was the starting point for for, for what right. i was interested to talk to you um, so just, uh, I'm sure many people are, um, familiar with your work, uh, but just, uh, as, as a kind of intro, you're an anthropologist at Stanford. Um, I mm -hmm. came across your work about 10 years ago when you, when you brought out, um, when God talks back. Right. Thank you. Uh, and this was a, it was a fascinating, uh, study of charismatic Christians. So Christians who get filled with the Holy Spirit particularly the Vineyard Church, uh, mm -hmm. which the, the kind of California church, that I think Bob Dylan was briefly a, a member of. Right. Um, I'm familiar with that world myself. I was briefly a charismatic Christian in the kind of uh, charismatic wing of the Anglican church. And, and it feels to me that that book, what you, one of the things you achieved was to help to kind of be an ambassador to that world for, mm -hmm. for secular people and, ex and explain what was going on there when they do things like talk to God and hear God talk to them, and that this wasn't just totally crazy, this was actually kind of um, a practice. Right. So could you tell, tell us a little bit about just what you learned in terms of people don't just instantly hear the, the voice of God. This is something they have to kind of learn and train themselves in, is that right? That's right. It's. And it's an easy and, of course, not easy story to tell. So I would see that this was a church that modeled um, an intimate relationship with God. So it, there was a kind of expectation that um, God would talk to everybody in the congregation. You didn't have to be a special kind of person, especially trained, especially this, especially that. And of course, people would come into the church and say, oh, God doesn't talk to me. Would you so-and-so, you, I know God talks to you. Would you talk to God for me instead? And the church instead would teach people sort of how to do this. And it wasn't, sometimes it was pretty darn explicit. Um, and sometimes it was pretty um, kind of less explicit. Um, but, you know, there were sermons on, you know, how we hear God speak, and nobody laid out a set of bullet points, you know, mm. primers. But people would begin to look for thoughts in their mind that they should imagine that were not their thoughts, but were actually thoughts given to them by God. And so there was a sort of way to search for, the, to pick out those thoughts. And the first thing they had to do was to think about their mind as open so that it was something in which God could place thoughts. They also had to pay attention to the structure, or the, not the structure, the texture of thought. And that's not an obvious idea for many people. But in fact, you know, our thoughts, some of our thoughts are louder than other thoughts, or they're faster than our other thoughts. Some thoughts feel like they carry effort. Some thoughts feel like they pop into our mind. And so people were invited to look for thoughts that felt fluid, effortless, um, that they just kind of just, they weren't, and they would talk about this differently. I wasn't thinking about it at the time. I didn't want to, you know, give money to the church, but I, I felt this, you know, that, that I felt I should, should do this. Hmm. It's often the content of the experiential content of the person who was searching for God's voice you know, some uh, humans experience thought differently. So some people have lots of words, some people have more impressions. And so some people would talk about that and, you know, recognizing God in different ways. They would then 
And they were then evaluated to invited to evaluate their own judgment. So people would say things like, if you think God is, so the pastor said this to me, you know, if God is telling you to jump off the bridge, that's not God. You've made a mistake. Mm. They would also say things like, you know, if you, this is something somebody said once, um, if you think God is telling you to relax and calm down, you know, just assume that it's God. But if you think God is telling you to quit your job, divorce your wife and move to California, you really need to see if that you're discerning that properly. And there's, you know, the, the, past, the pastor didn't mention divorce, but it was, the, you know, the, the pastor was more like, if you have the thought you need to quit your job and move, and move to another city, I want you to be praying with me. I want you to be praying with your house group. I want you to be praying with other people. And together we will discern. Um, they often had this notion of testing. And so testing was, well, you know, you're looking for something that confirms your judgment. So, you know, you, and people do this outside of evangelical Christianity as well. I would, I would came across this among middle-class magicians in London, but, you know, if you, you pagans. Like, pagans, yeah. So people would say things like, well, um, you know, I, I feel that God is telling me that I shouldn't pin my hopes on this particular university. And, you know, lo and behold, next day, I got an invitation to apply to a different university. I think, I think that was God. So, you know, the, the, there's the kind of testing equality. They would get people to pray for each other. So I, I remember a woman who was, you know, lost her job. It was easy for me to think that if you lose your job, you should move into a cheaper apartment. That didn't seem to be a complicated judgment. But for her, she really wanted to feel that God was telling her. And she you know, would ask people to pray for her. And one of them had this image of her when when they were when this other woman was praying, which the which my friend took to be an indication that she should stay in her apartment. And so people, you know, there's always this quality of, you know, you can't be totally sure, you have to interpret, this could be your judgment. People told jokes about people who would make the wrong judgment. So, you know, my so there favorite, was an appreciation. This was an imperfect process. Absolutely. And in fact, there was um, people would say things like people, a man in his 40s said to me, oh, that time when I was 10, I'm pretty sure that was God. And God at this point had just said, you know, his parents were divorcing. He said, just relax. But then he said, everything since then, you know, for the last 30 years, you know, it's not quite sure. It's not quite clear. So there's a strong recognition of the imperfection of the process. Mm. And it's clearly collective. And I suppose this is something different to spirituality where it's more, you might be more on your own. Here, this is a group process. You, you with your Bible group, with your prayer group, with the pastor. That's a really good question because it is and it isn't. So on the one hand, discernment absolutely was social you have this model of who who god is so how to recognize god and how to test how to evaluate whether it's god that's speaking and all that is social and for many many people they're going to prayer group and they're having conversations and they're all there's all this you know common discussion of oh you know, I had this experience and I, I, I think that it's God. And then somebody else says, isn't that funny? I had that too. Or you should also wonder whether maybe, you know, maybe it's time to test that a little bit more carefully. So there's a lot of social stuff. But it's also true that these are experiences that happen to people when they're alone. Mm -hmm. And so they are, you know, sometimes when they're in a group, but, you know, often, you know, prayer is this, Often God talks when somebody is not in prayer, but sometimes he talks when somebody is in prayer. And uh, so there's this kind of, you know, it's a very, very private experience that has this public sculpting as, as well. And would, I mean, I, uh, I guess that also um, one would sometimes think you could discern the voice of God 
in events in, for example, something that someone says that, we, you know, like particularly sermons, you know, pr priests would say, and if anything I've said here has really resonated with you and you think God is calling you to come up for healing or something like that. Yes. Or, and community members sometimes get words for other community members. Yes. So, so God's speaking in other kinds of ways. Absolutely. And so sometimes, you know, you know, somebody will get up and read a verse in the Bible that God has directed them to read, and it's hard to know what specifically follows from that. And other times, um, somebody gets up front and says, you know, I, I really think that God is telling me that we need to pray for knees. Who yeah. has a bum knee? Would you please come forward? Because I feel that I've been called to pray for you. And it's of course, often, it's um, often achy joints. It was like that in my church. Yeah. <laughs> achy joints or sometimes a you know, bad shoulder. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, of course, in, in the recent election, you know, there was this big issue because there were these prophets who, many prophets who had a very specific um, indication that Trump was going to win. And, yeah. you, know, you know, so. So it's a little messy. I mean, I, I um, people would mm. tell these stories like, um, like at the vineyard, people would say you'd go if you wanted to be work in prayer ministry, which meant that you had to wear a, like a red lanyard and you'd go up to the front of the church. And after church, you know, at the end of the church, the pastor would invite people forward who needed prayer. You know, go up to somebody with one of these red, you know, red lanyards and they'll pray yeah. for you. So you had to go through a training session, a couple of training sessions to do that. Mm. And often the training session would have the instruction that never um, interpret, you know, never get prophets, words of prophecy for birth, death, or marriage. It's just, you know, there's a risk you might be wrong. It's just too emotionally uh, meaningful for people. Right. And nevertheless, I mean, one of the people I, that really taught me how to think about this, you know, what did get a word of knowledge about pregnancy and, you know, her story to me was, oh, well, I tried to avoid this. I tried to avoid this. I finally blurted out to this woman that I thought she was going to have a baby. And I felt so embarrassed. And three weeks later, she came back and said she was pregnant. You know, that kind, that kind of thing also happens. Hmm. Um, you talk about, I mean, and I noticed it in my church as well, some people wanted God to talk to them and God didn't, you know, like, what, you know, yes. uh, what, is God not into me? Um, right. And some people, it was much easier. And you have done a lot of work suggesting there is there are personality traits that make someone more inclined to um, ecstatic experiences, to encounters with um, God's spirits and so on. Um, and you talk about absorption. Is that still the the the, the kind of term you use? Yeah. Yes. And we've what learned absorption. So absorb. Oh, so what a good question. <laughs> you know, and again, it's an easy question and a really hard question. So absorption mm -hmm. is the name of this of a list of thirty four question statements that was developed by um, Aki Telegan and um, I think David Atkinson. And they, came, they were looking for a pen and paper measure of hypnotizability, the ability to go into this kind of funky state. You shouldn't be, able, you shouldn't be scared of the word hypnotize, hypnotizability. It's, as they were using the word, they, they were thinking just about the human capacity to get really absorbed in a book. You know, you get huh. really wrapped up in a book. Right. So they, but it turns out this, this so the, the, the 34 statements are things like, Sometimes I experience the world the way I did as a child. If I want, I can turn music, noise into music by the way I listen to it. Um, sometimes when I'm watching a play or, or, or a movie, I, I forget mm. that it's not really real and it just feels real to me. Mm. So, you know, it's, it's you know, I, I, I really get, um, uh, I, I um, you know, I, get really drawn to the to, to poetry or to to to, to music yeah um the sparkle of a you know of, of a fire will fascinate me the flames of a fire will fascinate me yeah Something. so there's a real what so what i have seen remarkably robustly around the world so first of all before i tell you that um 
the, the way people answer these questions, that is, it, it is a, it's got a real relationship what people, psychologists would say a significant relationship to whether somebody could be hypnotized, but it's not a very big relationship. You know, so it's not like that doesn't feel like that's exactly what this is picking up. Um, one of the things I've seen is that this ro the absorption skill um, predicts to use a, 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 a verb that psychologists would use. It would pre it predicts people who have cool, weird spiritual experiences. Mm. So people, you know, the more people say true to these 34 statements, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, 24 rather than 18 or 26, you know, the more they come closer to 34, the more they say they've had a, heard a voice that nobody else can hear or seen a vision or felt yeah, the presence yeah. of a spirit or um, they, they also, they're more likely to say that God feels real or that God feels like a person or that they have a back and forth relationship with God. So they can do the stuff. So the guy who founded the vineyard, John Wimber would talk about, you know, we've got to go do the stuff. So if you are higher in absorption, you're more able to do the stuff. And that turns out to be true around the world. Hmm. You know, at least in the five countries. And you have, I mean, this suggests a, a relationship between fiction and uh, religion. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the, the similar capacity to get really absorbed in a story, whether that's a fantasy story or um, a, a religious story or myth. Uh, and I know you've written about, you, uh, I, I, I think it's in your work, like of, of religion as a kind of mass fan fiction you internalize a certain imaginary landscape mm -hmm. and then you become a character in it as well. So yes. like Marjorie Kemp, she, the, the medieval mystic, internalizes all the stories of the great mystics and then Jesus appears to her and says, uh, you are my favorite mystic, Marjorie. And, 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 and she starts to write fan fiction with her starring in it. So it's that kind of thing, right? Like the, the fictionality of religion. Exactly. Which doesn't mean that religion is fictional, but it yeah. does mean that in, the term I use is that religion is like a like a paracosm. A good religion is like a paracosm. So a paracosm is the name for a shared imaginative world. Right. Um, so like the world that the Bronte siblings cooked up together. So they, you know, they wrote stories about it. They wrote fan fiction about it. They developed their own language. Harry Potter is a paracosm. Everybody knows who these characters are and you can develop a set of ideas. Like, you know, you can develop your own ideas about things that aren't in the story. Like, like the question of whether Dumbledore really is gay. It's uh, so, <laughs> J.K. Rowling suggested that at some point, but people mm. had views, they had a lot of yeah. views because the story was so detailed. Yes. So a religion works best for people when it's like that. Just to yes. mean the, doesn't mean that the claims are fictional, but means that they work like fiction so that you can use the story to make sense of your own life experience. So you can, you know, That's you can really read, yeah, you read, the prodigal son story and you think about how it helps you understand your own life you will you know mm. and this um helps us to make sense of the the porous border between like sci-fi and fantasy and new religious movements and conspiracies the way right. that ideas sometimes leap from stories into religions and become kind of really true like say scientology is a classic example yeah. or uh i don't know uh the church of harry potter or like how certain ideas came from uh, uh novels and then became theosophy like theosophy took stuff from um edward bulwer lytton's 19th century novels mm -hmm. um and now with a lot of modern conspiracies they take ideas from movies and things so this is so that things sometimes yeah. kind of leap into and people start really believing them so I think that the hard thing to understand about religion is not so much why the idea of an invisible being feels plausible, but how it comes to feel real. 
So, you know, the, the paracosm helps it to feel real when it makes sense of your life so deeply. Absorption mm. helps to feel real when you have this orientation, this temperamental orientation to the world in which your inner world can kind of feel more alive. You know, these, mm. these um, that you could call training or practice or ritual when mm. you're in an event and you're thinking about God and everybody's singing about God or, you know, you're, you're, you're doing whatever, you're sort of talking about how the spirits are talking, are speaking back and everybody's trading stories about how, how to make it more, work more effectively. You know, you're thinking about it and you're learning to interpret and, and you're making sense of it. And then I think that, you know, these... Um, spiritual experience really makes a difference. And I, and I do think that the way that you imagine your mind tends to enhance whether you have these vivid personal experiences of God, uh, God or spirit. And yeah. so I think that matters, you know, whether, you know, how you um, represent your mind, um, how you treat thought. Right. Um, you know, your model of the self. Yeah, and so what? So some models work better than others, and if people do have this vivid sense that God has spoken, and they are prepared to receive that as personal evidence of God, it's super powerful. Yeah, and you talk about if you have a, a porous model of yourself, as in a, a bit like you're saying with vineyard, if you your yourself boundaries can be um whatever the word penetrated by god spirits angels demons right. and some subcultures in the west have more porous kind of models of self new age ecstatic christianity and then large parts of the world still have a more porous model of the self right um and, and so that, yeah. yeah go on so I'm, I'm still kind of fretting about what makes this porosity so powerful. But I think part of it is that thought just feels more real. You mm. know, thought feels like it does stuff. It is, it's causally powerful. It can live on its own. It can be, you know, you, your mind can leave your body and do stuff. Mm. And so it feels different. And so I think that that means that the immaterial just feels you're more prepared to experience the immaterial more materially. Mm. And, and you've done work recently on how different cultures frame unusual experiences. And right. one culture might say, that's just normal, but, but this kind of experience is supernatural, whilst another mm -hmm. culture might frame different experiences as supernatural. Could you mm -hmm. unpack that a bit? So, Partly, uh, yes. So there's this kind of interaction. So one of the things we found is that in these five cultures where we worked in the US in Ghana, Thailand, Vanuatu and China, mm. uh, you know, the more people, when people imagined thought as powerful, so this is an idea about thought. The more they were willing to say, yeah, they're special people. When they look at your food, they can poison your food. Or if you pray really hard, you know, you can win the lottery or something like that. Um, you know, the more people have said things like that, and it's not the same as religion. It's related to religion, but it's not the same. The more they have this cognitive model that their mind is somehow open and their thoughts act in the world, the more they say they've experienced God, they've seen, seen spirit, they've felt presence, they've had a whole range of un unusual, unusual events. Hmm. So that's true. Uh, that's tr also true that absorption predicts those things around the world hmm. as well. And absorption is not the same as porosity. Um, one of the things that is, um, um, so, so it's also true that people just have cool, weird experiences. Right? So it, it is not so uncommon. 
for people to have a break in their visual field. I don't think we know this neuroscientifically, but you know, people will sort of talk about funky experiences they have. And there are in a more secular setting when people have funky experiences, they, you know, they heard a voice, nobody was there. They dismiss them. And in, if somebody is prepared for an experience that's material, that's, that's kind of spiritually vivid, they're more likely to have those vivid experiences. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated because I don't want to say that it's also not true that the immaterial is real. I mean, so it could be the case that God is always talking and only people who are prepared to hear God's voice listen to that little tickle and then it flowers into a voice. I think that could potentially be, be true. But it is true that the, in some sense, the boundaries of the mind are always kind of loose and some people ignore it and some people do something with it. Yeah, we filter out our experience yes. all the time, I guess, and choose what we pay attention to. What's so interesting, what you, you were saying is it suggests that we some to some extent can choose our model of the self and that choice will then lead to the kind of reality we're in and the kind of experiences we have. Because we, we usually think of the model of self as just fixed. But you're saying it's kind of fluid. Mm -hmm. You become a born-again Christian. You're choosing a different model of the self, yeah. a different reality. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think it's a different model of mind. It's, it is also a different yeah. model of the self. Different model of mind, yeah. yeah. So if mm -hmm. you choose a, an understanding of the world in which there is this other being interacting with you, you have a different model of the mind. Yeah. And then you have to learn to experience that mind as more open. You have to learn to experience the mind as kind of able to um, have the presence of another being inside of it. Um, mm. and, uh, and that's really quite dramatic. I mean, people can learn to be possessed by spirits. Um, yeah. They can learn to have shamanic experiences. Mm. And real. you've done that. You've had that experience in your field work of uh habituating yourself to kind of pagan literature and then that actually began to a little bit affect your experiences now you had you had a kind of fleeting vision of druids exactly so i, I was reading i was really immersing myself in this literature about magic and witchcraft kind of like mm. nice pagan witchcraft mm. in uh and i was reading a a a, a book written by a member of one of these worlds called The Mists of Avalon, which many mm. people love, and which is about Arthurian Britain. And I woke, woke up one morning and I saw six druids standing by the window, which is really mm. an image out of the book, but I didn't experience it as something that I was thinking about. I experienced it as something that was real. So, you know, these, you know, back about, you know, depending on how you count, maybe 40% of people have some kind of oddly sensory event on the sleep, on the edge of sleep and awareness. Right. And if you are more excited by the idea of the supernatural, as I was at that point, you're more likely to have that pop into your awareness. Mm. You know, some people practice. So I met a man who, um, it's going to call Whitley uh, Streber who talked Wait to, wrote, yeah. that, uh, wrote that book on communion. And, you know, he is more, so he um, manages the boundaries between sleep and awareness. And it is on those boundaries that he has these really pretty material experiences of the little gray men showing up. He doesn't wow. experience them as dreams. But he, but he's able to use these kind of in between states to have these unusual events. Hmm. Well, so what I'm uh, looking at at the moment is, um, I, I guess I'm looking at New Age culture and what's happened to it during the pandemic and kind of spirituality and how it's been. Um, engulfed in conspiracy theories uh, and kind of anti-science, anti-mask, anti-vaccine stuff, conspirituality I've been writing about, 
Mm. And I'm, I'm also, I'm trying to think of how that culture, which I kind of consider my culture, can better practice discernment, balance the ecstatic with kind of critical thinking. I'm also interested in this shroom boom that we're in, this kind of psychedelic boom. And, you know, all, okay. all these people who are going to be taking, you know, are taking and will be taking psychedelics, who are being going to be thrown into the mystical deep end without necessarily many cultural resources to make sense right. of that. Right. I'm, I'm curious, you say you've been working on some of these um, issues, you say, at the moment. What's what has been kind of alive a for you in those topics? What have you been looking at? Well, so these are really good questions. I've been thinking about what advice I might give to people when they um, seek to discern what has happened to them. And I guess my rules are good is better than bad. Um, infrequent is better than frequent. Uh, I mean, so it depends on what you're talking about, right? Uh -huh. So let's say you're thinking about the question of, you know, I've, I've heard a voice um, is, am I going crazy to be, to be the most blunt? Yeah. So if in that domain, I would say in general, in general, and the rules aren't clear cut, in general, um, in rare is better than frequent. So many, many people have rare experiences. It's a little, you know, many, many people who are psychotic or who are ill have frequent experiences. So if you're hearing something many times a day, I'd kind of lean on the side of, okay, we want to think about whether, whether, whether you're well. Mm. Um, you know, um, short, if you're hearing a voice, short is safer than long. So most people who hear God, they hear four to six words um, if, they're, if it's an actual auditory experience. If you're hearing three sentences, that's more like people who end up in hospitals. Doesn't mean that you're gonna end up in a hospital, but it's just that that's what the pattern is. Um, and good is better than bad. So if you hear, I will always love you, um, and you, that makes you feel wonderful, that's a much better sign for whether you're going to be okay than if um, you hear die now it's a pretty terrible thing to hear but I mean you know and again if it's um, so you see these patterns in the world of how people are mm. um, it's you know so that's pretty basic um, what about if if someone takes um mushrooms or ayahuasca mm -hmm. and hears um you know feels like they get a powerful sense of this is what i should do um right. uh this was this was mama ayahuasca talking to me mm -hmm. or this was this was god talking to me um yeah. is there are there tools of discernment that you know the, the psychedelic community can take from other, from more step from religious traditions about Absolutely. how to make sense. Mm. Absolutely. And I think that there's this, you know, I mean, this is going to sound so banal, but there's this line from the gospels by their fruits, you shall judge them. So people have these whacked out experiences all the time. Well, not all the time. The people have pretty powerful experiences. Um, I think there's this, you know, one question is whether the result of their judgment seems good or, or bad. People aren't always the best judge of that themselves. Mm. Um, the other thing that I think is really helpful, so there's, a, there's the consequence and there's also the issue of specificity. So again, so the basic Christian um, vineyard idea mm. would be, if God tells you something that's generally good, like find a moral purpose, you know, settle down, find your center, 
you know, love your mother. You know, something pretty basic. Mm. Right. If God tells, if that, if the, if if uh, the plant sings to you, and says, "Never talk to your brother again." Well, the plant plant sings and says, "Expunge your brother." You know that's a real consequence that you'd want to be pretty careful. You know that that's yeah. So the more. Um, so I, I also think that, that one of the challenges is common sense. I remember going to when I was just graduating, when I was a new assistant professor, I was in um, San Diego and I was our university's PR person for weird stuff. <laughs> so this was a time, there were two things going on. First of all, I... Um, had been sought, I'd published this book on pagan witchcraft and you know, pagan stuff. And there was a woman who sought me out and said, you know, I didn't, I, I was with Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh for a long time. And I don't know why I stayed so long. And I read your book and I realized why I did. And what she said was that, you know, I, you can see from your book that there's this whole world of stuff that envelops you. And you don't notice when things, you might not notice when things are going way out of whack. And um, so she said, and my whole world was with Bhagwan. And it took me a lot, much longer than I should have to notice that there were, there were people being poisoned and there were, you know, that the yeah. money being misspent. And I, sure. said, I mean, somehow, it amazes me. Bhagwan is still one of the most popular spiritual teachers in the yes. world. It just amazes yes. me. Yes. So people are still enveloped in the in the in the paracosm. Yes. Yes. Osho. I yeah. mean, there and there are sites all over. And there was one in San Diego, although the, it wasn't um, Osho. It was like a related related to that. And I went along to that group because I was sort of intrigued. So this woman had come to me and she said, you know, a lot of people like me, they, they, they left Bhagwan, but they entered this group and these people are nuts. That was what she said to me when we were having dinner. So I decided to go see those people, see whether they really were nuts. And um, I went to this event and I have to say, I thought their practices are pretty darn powerful so that you'd want to be really clear that you trusted people like that they like they they did they were use these really powerful techniques of criticizing you and loving you and you know so when people talked about their cells becoming the edges of their cells be, become little amoebas and so they felt everything and they couldn't didn't have any point of judgment anymore and i just thought it was kind of weird the whole thing anyway this is all to say this is all background for the fact that I, I'm, I, so I met, I met this weird group and I thought they were pretty weird. And I, I thought, I'm not sure I can write about this group with love. And so I'm not gonna write about them. They scare me. So here I am sitting in you know, an assistant professor and at this, my university and heaven's gate happens. There is a group of 42 people who decide that this spaceship is following a comet. It's an invisible immaterial spaceship. And, if, and they all take barbiturates and vodka and die to follow the spaceship. And of course, NPR does a series on, you know, that's as a session on what do we make of that? When should we worry, be worried about religions? And to my astonishment, my interviewer was a member of this weird group. And the question she asked was, when do you know if something is a cult? And so, and I wanted to say to her, well, <laughs> You know, it, it, but it's yeah. it's really hard to draw the line from the inside. But in general, um, you know, the, the the harder it is for somebody to get a point of comparison outside the group, the more I worry. The more the ideas seem to deviate from the mainstream, the more I would worry. Doesn't mean that that that's not an absolute rule. It's not an absolute mm -hmm. rule at all. But if, um, you know, 
you know, if mainstream opinion says that this mushroom can kill you, I wouldn't take it. Mm. Even if, you know, you, you know it's, it's um, you know, there, there's sort of some general guidelines. So like one of the things that Heaven's Gate did is that you couldn't leave the house unless you were accompanied by a member of the group. So mm. it wasn't possible to go into the local grocery store and strike up a conversation with somebody who wasn't in the group and get a different point of view. Everything was within the group. And so you, if you left the group, you left your whole life behind. Mm. So it's, that's worrying, right? Yeah. It's, it's um, again, yeah. you know, then it's. So, I mean, these kinds of um, cultish thinking, conspiracy theories, um, have gone from the fringes where they were in the in the kind of 90s and noughties to being major things which 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 are, are right. impacting our politics. I mean, right. Obama said that he thought conspiracy thinking was one of the most serious threats to democracy. It um, is. What can what can religious studies how can can religious studies help us in this moment in terms of making sense of them and and what do we yeah. do about them? Well, I think it's easy, not easy, but it's something important religious studies can do to make sense of people as being normal humans within a, a you know, shifting a perspective rather than being you know, not quite human, which is sometimes you know, the polarizing debate feels like that. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that I think is helpful is to see that when people hold Religious claims aren't really held the way factual claims are. They're more about their identity. So I think when you see vaccine hesitancy, often, or climate change debates, it's often not about the facts. It's about the kind of person you are. And so it can be helpful just to know that. So, so that like, it, I'm, a, I'm a natural person. I'm into natural things. Yeah. and. Um, so it's the kind of person you are. And it also means that the claims are probably need to be managed differently. So you know, if you want to dissuade somebody of their Christian beliefs, you don't start with the idea that snakes don't really talk. That, you know, that person is really committed to the snake in the Garden of Eden, maybe, maybe not, but you know, that mm -hmm. but also so it doesn't really think that the snake talks. That's not really the point of talking about the snake. There's something else going on. Um, and so, you know, I think that, I don't know. I think that, so uh, thinking about that these are normal people, that uh, the beliefs are held in different kinds of ways, the ideas are held in different kinds of ways. Um, I gotta say the best, I think that myself, the, it would be great if we could get out of our news silos. And so particularly the news silos where the kind of the more extreme ideas become the only ideas people have. Mm -hmm. um, and I think yeah. that's- really Yeah, and, and, and there's a kind of, is there also something when, when the economy is in trouble when systems are, 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 you know, we're in a time of turbulence and transition, people are more prone to like apocalyptic thinking, um, right. to that kind of thing. You know, I'm, a, I'm totally with you. It's, uh, it's, it's been a claim like Norman Cohn write these, wrote these great books years ago. Yeah. So it's a little hard to say that this is an apocalyptic time. So we're, because it's any time that it's in trouble, you know, people worry that it's an apocalyptic time, but yeah, um, or just that people are more prone to thinking like that. I mean, I'm not saying it actually is a more apocalyptic time, but you know, like 17th century, like, and seems to be a similar kind of time now. I wonder. I, I mean, I think there's something to that. I also think that there is a story about. Um, uh, subsistence. So God, atheism is more available and God gets nicer when people are safer. And when people don't feel safe, they, you know, 
they they god gets meaner and religion is more important that's amazing it's exactly what happens with um people who hear voices uh the voices become more accusatory persecutory when they feel threatened yes. and and the kind of therapy is about trying to develop a kinder inner voice right and so it's an enormous capacity so the it's an opportunity to be helpful. Mm. It's also true that the voice, you know, the voices can even become really wise, you know, wise guidance. But yes, if somebody is threatened, all that internal world becomes much harder. Mm, yeah. Um, and just finally, uh, Professor Lerman, um, what does your what would the implications of your work in terms of psychiatry and how psychiatry treats people who have um, unusual experiences, God encounters, and so on? Do you do you feel like there should be a shift in how Western cultures, Western psychiatry relates to this kind of experience or this you know people who have that kind of experience? Yeah, I mean. To be frank, most psychiatrists wouldn't, you know, somebody comes into their office and they had a wonderful experience and everything's fine. They're not gonna mm. prescribe medication. I think that to me, the important lesson is more that when people have ongoing experiences of voices that aren't so great. So there's some reason that brings them into the psychiatrist's office, like, mm. And they've got little green men crawling up their legs and they don't like that. And sometimes mm -hmm. people have an amazing experience and then it's only over, you know, then the, then the clinician suddenly discovers that there's all this other stuff going on, which is the real reason that they're, that they're there. Mm -hmm. um, and I was thinking of an example in particular, some woman, when some psychiatrist who said, oh, this woman came to me, she seemed so healthy and didn't get what she was worried about until one day, kind of by accident, she mentioned the little green men um, and said she didn't like them. Um, so I think there's this big temptation in, in Western rationalistic settings to treat these experiences as irrational and not helpful. And particularly when they are, you know, not, not experiences people like there's an invitation to tell people to ignore them there are some alternative treatments that i think there's some support for and they they're all they're really varied you know they, they meaning that i don't think any of these treatments is a you know, you know a fix all for everybody i don't think any of them is panacea but it helps some people to teach them to treat the voice like a person. So, you know, just so the hearing voices groups, they mm. emphasize, name the voice, negotiate with the voice. And I think that some of those practices help to force the voice to behave more like a decent person. So the Julian As opposed to an absolute deity kind of thing. And, and just a, like a, you know, these voices really, terrible people you know so it's like so like and, and the the um avatar therapy you know what it's doing is it's um you know that you, know, you probably know this but they, they they represent the face with an avatar and then the therapist right. takes over the voice of the avatar and what the therapist does is that the therapist makes the avatar into a more reasonable human being so the avatar keeps saying, you know, starts out saying, you're worthless, you're worthless, you're worthless. And the therapist says to the human, tell the voice that you're not worthless. Tell the mm. voice that you did something nice for a little old lady today. Right. And you know, the person does this. And, you, and what's sort of striking is that, you know, in the demonstration, you can see the person being really anxious. You know, and then the therapist makes the voice nicer. And then the human has the model for the voice being nicer. So I think that there's something about, there's this paradox of making the voice more real that can bring the voice more in line. It's extremely imperfect because, you know, I also know people who 
really experience their voice as, um, you know, they just, that, so I was visiting with a woman who, whose son did exactly that. He, he was hearing voices. His aunt came and told him that the voice was um, you know, a demon. He needed to shut out the demons. And so he started mm. he experienced talking to an angel and the angel, he liked the angel. And then he freaked out his aunt because he developed a homosexual relationship with the angel, which his aunt liked to not think was appropriate. And so aunt appears. <laughs> You know, but then, you know, then the angel told him to kill his grandmother, and he, and he did. Oh God! So it's it's not like it's all it's all imperfect. It's all like yeah. really imperfect. Mm. But um, for some people, those techniques happen. For some people, I don't know enough about this, but for some people, they say ayahuasca helps. Um, mm. But, you know, I can also see, you know, there's a shaman, Ghanaian shaman who's, who was, was very hot from, for a while and he was leading people, you know, in the forest of California to you know, find their spirit. And I wasn't quite sure that it was helpful for everybody. People do have psychotic experiences when they meditate. Not everybody, you know, just a few sure. people. So it's, it's, We're it's kind of um, dancing with our subconsciouses here, I guess, and one's never quite sure what's going to come out. Yes. yes. So what are you working on now, if I may ask? Is, are you working, I mean, I, I know you brought out a book quite recently, so you're probably just at the mm -hmm. beginning of a research project or? No, I'm trying to write a book um, uh -huh. because it's, uh, um, so the other book was, should have come out earlier, as it were. So this is on voices. And it's exactly the question of good voices and bad voices, um, mm. voices of spirit, voices of madness. Um, how we, how are they the same? How are they different? Mm. How can we learn techniques from the one to manage the other? What does this tell us about our mind? Um, is I think there is something about this is a capacity humans have. You know, people have to learn to think about their thought differently mm. and pull it off. I mean, I've always felt that if you could really pull off um, having a good relationship with a Jesus or a spirit or a sprite, or, you know, it's often very, very helpful. Yeah, 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 and, yeah of course. But, you know, it's, you know, sometimes you know, it, it, all this stuff is in different sort of categories. So, you can cultivate a voice of creativity that feels like it's not yours and that feels a little more freeing. Um, huh. you, you know, yeah. it's it, um, people make invisible friends that they really like. So you can do that stuff and it's actually quite yeah. wonderful. I mean, athletes. So I've just been writing about athletes who cultivate their coach's voice to kind of fill up the void of their, you know, they get really anxious. If they yeah. just kind of sport where they just have to perform. And tennis really players, like, tennis players in between games look a bit crazy because they're kind of talking out loud to themselves. If you were sitting next to them on a bus stop, you'd uh, you'd edge your way. That's really interesting. It's um, yeah. so they really practice self-talk. They they train themselves in self-talk tennis players. Really? Who knows Ooh. about that? Um, I will. I will find some um, some some stuff for you. But yeah, you can go on YouTube and just like search for tennis players talking to talking at themselves, and they're just uh, oh. shouting away at themselves. So I, I um, I've been talking to, to gymnasts and figure skaters because that's those are sports I like, and mm. so the big thing there is that it's. Um, Anyone who goes out and performs, they can do the skill. Maybe not consistently, mm. but they can do it. Um, and so the big challenge is not to get scared, to be relaxed, and go into the skill with knowledge. And so some people are good at using their coach's voice to fill that anxious hole. So it's not like, in, you know, so swimmers have talked about this to me, you know, mm. it's like, or, or they, they, they'll, sing the alphabet to themselves mm -hmm. 
you know, and, and then the, the risk is that, you know, they all fail, right? Mm. They, they, at some mm. point, they, unless they get a gold medal and that's it, if there's <laughs> going to come a point at which they fail, and then that skill can bite them. And that, I think, is just really interesting. Yeah, yeah it's so very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Fascinating. Well, um, that, sounds, that sounds a great book. Yeah. Um, I shall see. Yeah. Well, look, thank you so much for your time, Professor. Uh, really an fun. honor, privilege to speak, to speak to you. I really found your work helpful, so, and I, like many other people. So thank you very much. Thank you, Well, It's been a pleasure. Great questions. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.